So first of all, welcome to Dying Matters, a conversation around death, dying, and bereavement. I just want to say thank you for coming. I know I know some of you, and some of you were courageous enough to be able to come on a topic that's not always very popular. And so first I want to say thank you for that. The second thing I'd like to say is that um, sometimes in conversations about death, dying, and bereavement, things might come up for you, maybe memories or some of the things you may not have thought about. And so I just really want you to I want to encourage you to really be able to take care of yourself. If you need to leave at some point in time, um, by all means do that. I would say um, take a friend with you. There are some Kleenexes around and those kinds of things, and I'm totally fine with being able to hold a space for you while you do that. Just know that. If you need support after, because you might find that, once again, things will come up for you or memories, then talk to someone, do some journaling, do the things that you know to really be able to take care of yourself. It's oftentimes the, the one or two things that we oftentimes forget is to be able to take care of ourselves first and then ask for help. So I really uh, want to hold you. Um, do I have your agreement that you'll take care of yourself in that way? Yes, Thank yes. you. So what I would like you to do is just for a moment, if you're comfortable, is just to close your eyes for a brief moment. And I just want you to take some deep breaths, just come into the present moment here and now. Just be really present. Pay attention to your body. How do you feel? Letting go of the hustle and bustle of getting here, and even letting go of the things that you might do after you leave. And I just want you to imagine, you know, your own time. When the time comes for you, for your own dying and for your own death, what that might look like for you, what you imagine. Who might be there, where you might be, what you see, what you smell what you feel around you. Just be able to have a sense of that. And we're not going to linger on this too long, but just have a feeling. Just pay attention to your body and what your body feels like in this moment. So just reflect. So now I want you to grab all of that which you feel and come back into the chair, into the present moment. Open your eyes slowly and come back to the room. Not always an easy task, and I didn't want you necessarily to be there too long because it does bring up often some uncomfortable feelings. And so I want to ask you, for those of you um, who were able to close your eyes and go back there. Were any of you in a hospital room? And raise your hands, okay? So there was a few. Were any of you at home? At home, a few at home. Out in nature? Were there a, a lot of people around? Not too many, a few, okay. Were you alone? Some people were, okay. So I just want to, in that reflection, and from the audience as well, you can see that there is a variety of different ways in which you might imagine, or you might envision, or you might find yourself towards the end and at the time of your death, whether you're in a hospital or whether you're at home, whether you have nature, people around you, or whether you're, you're alone. And so it's the first point to be able to remember that our dying and our death and our bereavement are very individual. They are based on who we are, the histories that we have, the kinds of relationships that we have in our life, and who we have come to be, and who we potentially might still grow to be. And so we never quite know what the end will be like for any of us, or where we might be. Because there's only really one truth, and that is that we all, one day, not sure when, some may have a better sense of when that might happen, we're all going to die. And it is probably one of the only things that we know 100% for sure, and yet most of us don't plan. We're starting, but most of us don't really plan for that which is inevitable. We plan trips. We you know, make huge trips. We have travel agencies, 
right, to be able to do that. And we go there joyfully to be able to plan our trip. But it's not often in the planning and the preparation of our dying and our death that we take a lot of time. So what I would like to share with you this evening is a little bit about the past, a little bit about the present, and a little bit about the future in relationship to death, dying, and bereavement. So before we go into that, I want to tell you a little bit about me. I was a trained nurse. I actually um, trained as a labor and delivery nurse, which is kind of interesting given what I'm going to talk to you about today. And in my experience as a nurse in my early 20s, I trained in how to deliver babies and was really privileged enough to be able to catch one of those wonderful children being born into the world and the explosion of energy that happened when that life came into being into this physical form. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of work in Ontario when I graduated, so I ended up working across the country in British Columbia where I was a nurse in a, in a long-term care home. Very different spectrum from birth to the end and death and dying. And it was my very first exposure to death to be really intimate with it. I've had family members who have died and, and had a long lineage of a history within my own family that I didn't even know about until I was probably in my early 20s, finding out the story that my mother's first child actually died three days after he was born. And that had an impact. Even without my knowing, it had an impact. And so when I came to the long-term care home and was tasked uh, as a nurse to be able to care for the dying, I was prepared in my training, medication, how to be able to provide some support in the pains and symptoms of the physical aspect of death, and maybe even a bit from what I remember of how to care for someone with their psychosocial, spiritual pain that they might be having. But nothing really prepared me for being able to sit at the bedside at a, very, at a time for most people that's very uncertain, and certainly for most people it is the very first time for the person dying and for their families having this experience, this very intimate experience with death. And so I wanted to learn more. And without my own awareness, in some way, shape, or form, because this um, knowledge and love of being able to share what I know and what others have taught me about death and dying didn't come to fruition until much later when I found myself being a palliative care nurse in a community and working with people in their home. And again, the invitation to be with people who are dying and to be with their family was something that was a real honor for me to be able to do that. And I did the best that I could. But there were still pieces I didn't know. And so I wanted to go out and learn more. And so I read a number of different books by Ram Dass, by Joan Halifax, and many of the authors who speak about death and dying and loss and bereavement, and even some of the mystics. Which brings me to the past. And the past is that death is something, and dying and, and loss, is something that humans have been dealing with their whole life. It is part of what makes life possible, you could say, is that there is a cyclical pattern. If we all lived forever, we wouldn't have those changes. And we may not even have sort of the progression of humanity and evolution as we do. And so everything that I'm going to share with you in this, in this hour and, and then some is from my own experience. It's from the number of different books that I've read. And I've gotten to this point where I'm not quite sure who said what, but I'll tell you some stories to the best of my ability that I remember them. Because memory is a funny thing. We don't always remember the exact details. And it's based on perception, depending on who was there and how they perceived the event. And that brings me back to that individuality. So those are, these are my knowledge, my experience that I'm going to share. Some of it might validate what you already know. Some of it might contradict what you already know. And some of it might even make you feel uncomfortable, might surprise you. I'm not sure. So I allow you to be able to have whatever experience that you have. So let me go back to the past. I just, we just have to go back maybe 150 years ago. And the way in which people died, where and how and why, was very different from what it is today. So imagine yourself in 1915. Wow. 
1915. You imagine the circumstances of even just Western, the Western world, so Canada and, and the United States, and you kind of imagine what it might have been like for people who, who were dying. Usually, people died at that time of old age, frailty. They would die usually of infection, sepsis, or they would oftentimes die of traumatic events, um, you know, tractors and things, workshop, right? That's why we, we developed health and safety so that people wouldn't actually get harmed or die in the workplace. And those were some really great things to be able to do. Getting kids out of the workplace, you know, getting them into schools, all of those different things of our Western world and its development has assisted in keeping people safe, keeping them healthy, and truthfully, allowing us to be able to live longer. And there were also those folks who died at home, who were surrounded by extended family. Back then, I can imagine, in 1915, big families, right? Six, seven children, especially in the countryside where the kids would have to help with the farm and do all the things that needed to be done. And so there were oftentimes big families and probably not a lot of funeral homes at that point. And people would die at home and they would have a wake at home and people would come and visit and laugh and reminisce and talk about all of the things they would miss about the person, the things that they maybe didn't like about the person. And the families would come together, maybe in gathering, maybe in conflict, whatever it was for that family. It probably wasn't that common for a person to, to die in a hospital at that time. It might have been for some, but not for the majority. Today, 75% of people want to die at home, close to 75%, and those are polls in, done in Canada. And the reality is that close to 70% of people die in hospital. And so there's a bit of a disconnect between what people want and what they're asking for and where death actually happens. And now it seems that sometimes I work in healthcare right now, and what I can say is that, you know, it's not a surprise that we have a large aging population who will need care. And although the history of death and dying and bereavement has come from the places of modern science and, and our medical system, which has really enhanced how we live and brought us safety, as I talked about, what it has also done is that it has medicalized death and dying and even bereavement to the point where we have specialists and we need those palliative care specialists because there are some folks in their dying who have a really difficult time. The complexity of their illness, the complexity of the pains and symptoms that they might have due to their illness, they need those specialists. They need folks who can really help them in all of those aspects, even dealing with their mental, emotional well-being. But I would say that for majority of people, they want to be able to have the kind of death where they feel empowered, where they feel that they can choose where they want to go. And a lot of it has to do with choice and where people want to be able to die. And so we're trying to shift. You know, this is a collective shift that we're engaging in to be able to, in some way, you could say, bring death home, bring it to us, and be able to create a space in which it can be honored in our dying because there's a lot of lot that we can learn from folks and so that's partly what I want to share. I've been at the bedside uh, of not as many as some of my colleagues but each and every one of them have impacted me in a very deep way. I've been at the bedside of a young woman who was 54 and encouraged her 12 year old daughter to be there for it even though I knew it would be uncomfortable. And I wanted to be able to create a space where in the last memory that she had of her mom, it was that of empowerment and loving her to the very end and beyond. I've been at the bedside of holding a man, again, in his 50s, we're all pretty close, who died very suddenly, pulmonary embolism after 10 years of, of being able to struggle with cancer, different forms of cancer. And he died on the night before he was to go downstairs into the hospital bed, still dying in his own home, 
but he really wanted to stay with his wife. Interesting. I've been at the bedside of folks who are elderly, who have a wonderful life, and it is just the natural progression of our bodies to be able to let go, to be able to close things down and to be able to die. That's normal. That's what our bodies were meant to do, actually. They weren't meant to live 300, 400, unless you could hold the energy that long. And that death often, it was very quiet, almost uneventful, as the person had taken their last breath. And so, again, it goes back to sharing with you that there are those variety of different ways of how, how we die. And people are searching, I would say, from the folks that I have talked to, searching of how they can empower themselves in the last days, weeks, months of their, of their death. And, you know, it's interesting because most of the people that I've been with and those who are, who are doing their dying, they're, they're not, haven't died yet, is they share with me some of the things, and I've asked them, what are the really important things? You know, what are the things that you can share with me? And there's lots of books that are written about the same topic. What is it that people really need to know? Before you go, what's the thing that you want to share? And, you know, they often say very simple things, things that you all know. They say things like, I wish I could have spent more time with my kids. It would have been great to have my whole family here. You know, I have some regrets about the things that I've done, and I have some regrets about the things that I will never get to do. And sometimes they even say things like, I want to die. Can you help me to die? So some people have wishes of being able to end their life. And they talk about simple things like being out in nature and those memories that they have of being with family. I haven't heard yet somebody say to me, you know, I wish I would have worked more. You know, it would have been great if I made more money. Because the truth is, none of us can take it with us. I read a recent uh, Facebook post, and I encourage you to find it if you can, and that was Steve Jobs. And there was a picture of him with a friend, and at that point, Steve Jobs was in a very frail state as his body was starting to, to die. And in it, I can't tell you word for word, but he pretty much said, you know, if I knew what I now know, I probably would have done things a little differently. And so imagine, if you can, if you had that awareness every day, and I'm not talking about bringing death to you or being dark and being in the gloom of death and sort of putting death on a pedestal, but just having the awareness that one day, you don't know when, and some of us do, we all will die. That can actually inform us how to live. In some of the teachings that I've been, I've have, and from some of the elders and my teachers, is teacher, or sorry, death is the teacher of magical transformation. And it's not really speaking from my understanding. It's not really speaking about the fact that you can transform your body through the death of your body at the end. Although you are a totally new human than you may have been seven years ago because our cells reproduce and die all the time. They have a natural cycle of death giving life, right? We know that. But death is a magical transformation to allow us to be able to shift our perception, how we see life. When you live, when I live simply and am aware of friends I have and the relationships that I have, when I can honor the food that I eat, where I can be thankful for all that I have in my life, when I can hold that gratitude of life, knowing that one day it will end for me, that changes my perception. Not in every moment, because I slip into it as well. I get caught up in the hustle and bustle and in the stress and all the things I have to do and all of the pressure. But when it's really important, and especially when I have to make decisions about how I live my life, and it's the how, not the what I do, but the how I live my life, then death can be a teacher because it can change my perception. And I, 
maybe like you, maybe not like you, is I have all of the folks that I've been with who were dying, and all of their families, and all of those experiences, and I hold that as an awareness, and I can still hear their voices telling me, I wish I had more time with my family. I wish I would do the thing that I love to do. I wish I took more risks. Can you imagine? More risks? I wish I would have said the thing I was too afraid to say. And so in some way, I do this talk, and it is what motivates me, because it is mine to do. And I hear those voices behind me, call them my ancestors, those who have come before me, who help me to be able to say what needs to be said. So we're at a very interesting time right now. You might be here for a very specific reason, and you're here for the right reasons. You may not know them yet, or you might know why you're here. And humans are at a very interesting time. We have a lot of negativity out there, right? You don't have to look too far to be able to see it. You have some, we have some beauty as well, but right now it seems like there's a lot of dark going on. There's a lot of struggle, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknowns. What will happen? What, what does this mean? One of the things that I did just the other day, and it concerned me, is that I oftentimes will use the internet to find more information, and it's been a really great source of finding different speakers and different materials on, on death and dying and bereavement. And so I looked on YouTube, what are people watching as it relates to death and dying? And it scared me a bit because one of the things that people are watching and some of the most popular YouTube videos are of people dying. Not empowered deaths, but tragic deaths, sudden deaths, and that concerns me. I have my opinions about physician-assisted dying, and this is not a debate around whether you're for or you're against, but it's an interesting question as to why people want that choice, and so many, even though there's only a very small percentage of folks who will be able to have access to that choice when it happens, because it will. But it's an interesting question to ask why. And so it's not to put a damper on life, but it's to be able to maybe give a little bit of rise and say, hmm, what is it about that? What I know as I, I trained as a psychotherapist is that sometimes the tipping point to getting a change to happen is that the pain of staying the same is so bad that you just want to be able to change. And you change, you, you make the move, you leave the relationship, you leave the job, you do the things that you needed to say because the pain of staying the same is worse than changing. And so I wonder if there's something about our desire for death, maybe it's our desire for death education <laughs> like this. Maybe it's our desire for the conversations that have been hidden from even the medical field who are taking care of the folks that are dying. I have one of my colleagues who says that it is not that we're death, in, in, that we have death denial, it's that we're actually death ignorant, that we have forgotten to really have an understanding of why death is present with all things. All things die. You know, when you eat, that plant has been cut. If, you're, if you eat meat, that animal gave its life to you. And so there is a cycle and a relationship that we have with death every single day. You know, as a nurse, it's always a running joke that nurses love to be able to talk about bodily functions all the time. <laughs> we go through those deaths every single day. I mean, if we didn't, we get pretty sick. You know, for women, they're a little bit closer to those death cycles. Because as women bleed and they have their time and they give birth, those are all deaths. Those are those small deaths. You know, you see out in nature, I, I'm hoping and wishing that it would snow, for that is a type of death. And you could say that for many of the animals and the plants, they don't quite know what to do without the dying, right? Without the temperature going down so they can actually sleep and rest, 
right? That's why we talk about death as the sleep or the rest. And I hate those kind of euphemisms anyways. It's, it's death. It's dying. And we don't even have to talk about that. We can just say, you know, what are the things that are important to you? So here's where we come to the preparation piece, right? How can you prepare for the inevitable, for the 100% guaranteed thing that will happen? Nobody knows when, not sure how. Is there's a few things that you can do. Number one, you're already here, so you have the willingness to be able to hear and to have these conversations around death and dying. Number two, you might want to start journaling or finding some ways to figure out what are the elements, what are the values that are important to you that you want to sustain and maintain as you're reaching that event horizon. You know, what are the, do you want to be in a hospital? And if, if you do, that's fine. That's fine. If you want to be at home, what would that look like? Who would be there? What are the things that are important to you? We talk in, in our medical field, and, and you probably heard already around advanced care planning, right? So that's one of the ways to be able to prepare. But it's not about a workbook. That just helps you to find the values and the things that are important to you. What's really important about advanced care planning, or just, it, it really is about having a conversation Having a conversation first with yourself about what is important to you, what do you value, and, and just know that it will change. This is why you need to go back, because like I said, even in your physical form, you are not the same person you were seven years ago, and our values, our beliefs change. I hope they do. That's what makes us want to grow and be curious and to learn, and hopefully it's more towards being a decent human being but you will go through those changes. So continue to have those conversations with yourself and have the courage to have that dialogue with your family and friends. And this might be difficult because not only, um, you know, the general public is sort of not wanting to know about death and dying, but your family. And that sometimes it is hurtful when they don't necessarily have an open space for you. So I have some advice, and that is that maybe not use the word dying or death. I'm preparing for my death, and I want you to know what I want. You may not need to do that. But just say, and I often, often say this when I do any uh, different kind of training, you know, I went to this talk, and this woman talked a little bit about, you know, death and dying. It's kind of, you know. But she had some good points, and she sort of got me to start thinking about the things that are important, you know? And I don't know if you know the things that are important to me. Can we maybe talk about that? Whatever way that is for you. You know, there's times to be able to just validate for yourself whether or not your family, your partner, your friends actually know what values and what is important for you. Because we make a lot of assumptions and we don't often check them out. So it's good to check things out just to be able to get on the same page. When we talk about advanced care planning in, in the medical field, we often talked about substitute decision maker and consent, and those things are really important. Because in Ontario, and it is, I'm talking about Ontario because we're here, and it might be different in other provinces and other, other countries, is advanced care planning is really about you letting the people in your life, and specifically your substitute decision maker, whether it's the person within a certain hierarchy in the legal system of Ontario, or whether it's somebody you assign as your substitute decision maker through a power of attorney, and I know it's kind of a lot of logistical words. It's really about letting them know what, you, what your wishes are and what your values are, so that if there ever comes a point in time when you're not mentally capable to tell someone or tell a medical person or to give consent for a treatment or stopping treatment. Somebody else understands you. Somebody appreciates and is willing to be able to speak on your behalf. So that's that advanced care planning, right? So if you want to have those conversations, then please do. And you can look up the workbook and it has some really useful questions for you to be able to ask 
to engage in that conversation. But what I want to really continue with is being able to share with you um, or encourage you to be able to do the preparation. So I talked about being able to have those conversations with yourself, being able to have those conversations with others, be able to engage your imagination of what that might look like and where you might be. And the other is to really be able to every day to hold that awareness in what it is that you do. You know, um, again, we're before Christmas and today, and today's tomorrow, I think, is the shortest day where there isn't a lot of light. And, you know, it, to be able to reflect on, on our own death and dying is a way to be able to bring life. If you want to see a great movie, I don't know if any of you have seen it, Death, Death Makes Life Possible, or read the book Death Makes Life Possible. One of the things that in that book the author talks a lot about is about our spiritual nature or our um, human nature, you know, that which is other than our physical form. I'm sure that many of you would agree that we are far more than our physical reality, that there might be even things that we can't see, hear, that are going on. The universe is a very big place, and our small little blue planet is just a tiny little planet in that big galaxy. And it's a big space. I mean, I can't even imagine how vast that is. So it's possible that our understanding of life and death and what happens after and what are all the things that we can't see is much bigger. You know, 100 years ago, we knew about uh, bacteria, we knew about illnesses, we knew about some of the impacts on our physical body. And it wasn't until people dove more into it and were curious about those things that they developed more understanding. They asked more questions. And really, the, um, I would say the evolution is because we ask more questions. We're curious. We're curious to know. What? Death? Life? How do they come together? So my own search in that is, has been about the curiosity. So again, I encourage you to be able to be curious. If you have an opportunity to be able to do some volunteer work, and to be at the bedside. Again, it's, an, it's kind of an invitation. You want to be really careful and be, be really aware about your own presence when you're present with someone who's, who's dying and, and their family. And even those folks who had a death of any sort. You know, At this point, I'm talking not just about physical death. I'm talking about loss. You know, One of the huge impacts is that when someone dies physically and that we've had a long relationship with. We feel that. Grief does a very interesting thing to our physical body. It has a physiological impact on our body. And what it does is it makes us stop. Most people, when they talk about the impact of their grief, talk about the inability to be able to think clearly that their emotions are all over the place. And when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross first developed the stages of grief, she actually wasn't talking about stage one, denial, stage two, acceptance. She wasn't talking about that. Those are all of the expressions that can happen in a split second that occur when somebody's facing and is in their grief. And so again, it brings it back to everyone's death and dying and bereavement and their grief is very individual based on who they are, their history, their relationship, where they come from, what kind of world views do they have. So it's all about an exploration and the expression of that. So grief makes us take a pause. It brings us fully present. And that, in, in a way, is, is what death does as well. The other thing that, that dying and death and and grief does, is it actually puts you right in the unknown. There might be a few people that I know of that have died and come back, but they've only had a very short period of time in that space in between. 
And so there are those. You can, you can search them out. Dying to be Me is, one, is a really great book where the person talks about what they experienced, their experience in the, in the time when they were physically and potentially uh, mentally dead and having that opportunity to be able to come back. But there aren't many of those. And so for the person who's dying, that is the very first time, very first time that they're in that space and everything is an un unknown. And so if you can imagine, it's probably really um, unnerving, probably brings up a lot of anxiety and it does. And we talk about anxiety and restlessness and pain. And there is a pain with dying, not only as it might come up because of an illness that the person has and the pains of the physical body, but also the emotional pain, the psychosocial and the spiritual pain. Somebody who has lived a long life may have pain, again, of the things that they might have regretted that they did or didn't do. And sometimes, or I would say most of the time, what people who are dying really need is just someone to listen, just someone to hear their story, you know? just someone to bear witness to all of the totality of who they were in the good and the bad, in the magnificent and the horrible. We all, in some way, shape, or form, want to be able to tell our story and in this way, we can somehow be able to be immortal because we'll be remembered. It's another piece that is really important in death and dying and bereavement. And that is that one of the reasons, and, and there are many people who speak about this, Stephen Jenkins is one, talking about the fact that the reason why we deny death or the reason why oftentimes we find ourselves struggling in life is because we haven't actually sustained and maintained the relationships of those who have come, who came before us. You know, we, we make, we have our shrines in, in Western, Medi Western uh, world, we have cemeteries and we have the places where we lay our dead and honor them in that way. And in other cultures, they express it in a very different way. But I would say that I would encourage all of you to be able to go back and have those conversations with the people who have died, whether they be your grandparents, whether they be your parents, whether they be your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your children, to have those conversations. Because part of grief and bereavement, and we don't always do a really good job at this, is to reestablish those relationships. Those are the lasting bonds that we have. And even when the person is dead and you can't really speak to them, you, st you can still find ways through different avenues and different schools and different streams to be able to do what we call finishing the unfinished business, where you can still call out the person and be able to talk to them about the things you want to thank them for, about the things that you were really mad about, about the ways in which they hurt you, about the ways in which they were and what they meant to you in life. And those are still important pieces to be able to remember that. We're busy all the time doing things and maybe on an anniversary we, we remember, you know, and, and sometimes we forget. I know I've, I can't remember when my grandparents died. I'm hoping that I will remember my parents are still alive and I hope that I will be there because that's what they promised me. <laughs> never make promises because you never know what can happen. But I hope that I'm there to be able to support them because I know that that will be meaningful for me. And I hope that I can remember that I don't forget to have those connections, even though it might be painful to remember. You know, you drive down the 401 and you see the big signs, lest we forget. As humans, we have forgotten some things. It goes back to my teachings of the people who are dying. We forgot about the simple things sometimes. We forget about the simplicity of sharing our love with other people, of being able to be truthful, of being honest, of speaking from the heart. 
We have forgotten how to do that because we are afraid. We're afraid of what people will say to us, how they might treat us. So I can't tell you that in the moment of your dying and your death, you won't be afraid. Because even for someone like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, <laughs> who I would consider one of the grandmothers of palliative care movement, she was pretty mad when she was dying. And part of it, I think it is that humans have an insatiable will to live. Even in the face of death and even in knowing in our dying, there is still that surge of that life wanting more life. So saying that death is uh, you know, somehow going to suppress your life or somehow going to dim your life, it's actually not true because even for those folks who are dying, they still are engaged in that moment. I don't know if any of, of you have, have ever written, uh, read Tuesdays with Murray, you know, classic book. Um, something that was um, written um, to assist a dying person to be able to have enough money to die at home. And Murray really uh, shared in, in very honest ways of how to be in that uncertainty. He didn't like it, but he was willing to be in it. And he also talked a lot about having the folks be with him. And one of the things he said that in his vulnerability and in his ability to be open, and some would say almost be a burden, he had the willingness to be able to allow other people in and to feel that connection between another human being. And he gained so much from it. And the people who were with him also learned a lot. You know, I sometimes have many people ask me, what do you do for a living? And I say, oh, you know, I work in hospice palliative care. And their response usually is, that must be very depressing. And I say, you know, it's sad, but it is such a joy. It's such a privilege and such an honor to be at the bedside. A couple of weeks ago, I had met someone and they asked me, what do you do? So I thought, hmm, I'll take a jump and do my new thing that I really want to do. I said, I'm a death educator. A what? A death educator. And I love it. And they were a little taken back. OK. I know it's going to be a, a bit of a transition right, to start all these conversations. But if you, again, look up Death Cafe, you know some of the things that are popping out, you source out some of the maybe not the mainstream movies or even the books. But there are those conversations. Another wonderful book that I read fairly recently was Final Gifts. And it was a book that talked about the secret language of the dying. It talked about the fact that for most people who are dying or have an awareness of death, whether they have a prognosis or a timeline, they actually know that they're dying. And my experience has been that most folks within the last few weeks, days, hours, actually know they have that awareness. And oftentimes, they try and share that by telling stories. Or in the language that they know how, maybe they're not familiar in talking about the truth what is, because that's sometimes hard. So they'll talk about things like, I'm going on a trip. I'm getting ready. I'm building that final house. I'm getting my plans in order. They talk about those kinds of things as clues to us to say, oh, they're getting ready. There are also those who have closer experiences to those other worlds that I talked about that we can't see or touch or taste or smell. And they talk about some of the people that they already see and they haven't, they haven't died yet. And we usually call those delusions. We usually associate them with uh, medical treatment or painkillers or some of those kinds of things. But there have been studies as recently as probably in 2013 that actually take some of these experiences and realize that folks actually aren't on medication, that there's something else that's going on, that there's an ability of the person who is dying to have another level of awareness and be able to communicate with their ancestors, the folks that have come before. And I don't know whether it's inside 
the neurology of the brain and the receptor firing? I'm not sure. But there's enough to be able to be curious and to say, hmm, I wonder if that's possible. We only really use a small fraction of our brain, right? And we want to be able to use more. But what if our brain is just the functioning system and there's other things that are going on? You know, sometimes we walk into a room and we can sense things. We are far more sensory than just through our brain and through what we see. When people are dying and they're close to death, they sometimes get oversensitive. You know, lots of stimulation sometimes creates that restlessness. Oftentimes, people seek to find some silence, some quiet. And hospitals aren't the best places to get quiet, to get the silence. When people are close to the end, they spend a lot of time sleeping. And sometimes that's hard for the family members or those people who come to them because they still want to spend a lot of time with them. But they're slowly trying to separate. Marie talked about his difficulty in the detachment from the people that he loved and cared about, from the things that meant a lot to him. And finally, the detachment from his physical body and from the life as he knew. He had a hard time with that. And I think I will probably have a hard time with it too when my time comes. But I can learn how to do that now. I can take the time and be quiet. You know, one of the best places, I know most of we're in Toronto now and it's, it's pretty busy. If you can find some space, even in the city, and you can, because I have, is find a little bit of space where you're out in nature. Maybe just your back against a tree, could be. And to just find that quiet. If you have a chance to go out in the country, I encourage you to do that. To do that, Because one of the best things to do is to go out, feel what that feels like, and then bring it back. So you have a memory. So you have that way to connect to that quiet. Again, a very simple thing. Fine, that silence. The other is just to be in gratitude, right? So I start off with being in gratitude for you being able to be here and helping me to be a death educator and to share with you what I know. And so being in gratitude, if you can, every day, every moment, if you could, but we're not saints, and I'm certainly not. And like I told you before, I oftentimes forget. When you sit and you eat a meal, be in gratitude for the life that the plants, that the animals, that the people who prepared it gave. Just be in gratitude for that. It really helps. One of the things that oftentimes is hard to do, and I'm just reminded of it now, is, is to be in gratitude of some of the challenges the confrontations, the things that might have, for me, frustrated me, but have actually helped me to get to another place of realizing of what's important. You know, sometimes in looking at the world, and I don't watch a lot of TV, actually I don't watch any TV, I don't read the news, I can barely listen to eight minutes of CBC, because, um, of what's going on. And it's hard to be in gratitude when you're being bombarded with the tragedies of our world. And so I find my way to seeing the beauty. And so I pay attention to the puppy <laughs> that's on the side of the road. And I ask, do you mind? And I pay attention to the little babies. You know how sometimes kids have a way to just lock eyes on you? Just pay attention to those kinds of moments to the birds, to the pigeons, even the pigeons who are fairly abundant because we haven't had a lot of snow, <laughs> but just to be in that, in that gratitude. And again, I, it's not always easy, and we all get triggered. But the more that I have death as a teacher, it has the ability to change my perception. And I'm hoping that if enough people have these conversations about the things that isn't very popular, death, dying, and bereavement, we can be able to bring more awareness and realize that having 
this dialogue around death and dying can bring life to us, can bring life to the world. Or at least to be able to offer every single one of us the right to have as much life as we can before we physically die. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you what I know. And there's many more things. <laughs> I, again, just remind you that if you find yourself thinking, having memories, not always feeling comfortable, do what you can for yourself to take care of yourself. If you are caring for someone who, or if you yourself are someone who is in clear awareness of your own death and dying, care for yourself. Honor yourself in that way. Oftentimes we don't give enough compassion and gratitude to those folks who care for people who are dying. And it's not easy work. It's hard because the reality is when you're with death, you actually realize and have an awareness of your own immortality, your own end. Right? <clears throat> or immortality. Mortality. <laughs> See that? Because for me, in some way, and this is uh, other teaching that I have, is death actually isn't the opposite of life. It's not. Birth is the opposite of death. Life is what happens throughout. Thank you.